Welcome to the backstory on Longmont's Economic Development Partnership, or LEDP. I'm Tim Waters, and as a volunteer for Longmont Public Media, I host the backstory, which is an opportunity for you, Longmonters, to learn a bit more about what goes on in the city, stories that uh, you might read about in the newspaper or see something on social media, uh, but might have more questions or would be would benefit from more information on what, what is the backstory on whatever it is you're reading about. And today, there's an opportunity to go deeper, to learn more about Longmont's Economic Development Partnership, what that means, who's involved, why does it exist, what does it produce, and we're going to have a chance to learn all that from Jessica Erickson, who is the president and CEO, right title, Jessica? Yes. Of Longmont's Economic Development Partnership. So, Jessica is, uh, for those of you who might watch the backstory, you know Jessica is not a newcomer to the backstory. She's been featured on a number of these. Most recently and probably the most significant is the decision by Costco to expand their operations to locate in Longmont. That is still in process for those who, who mm -hmm. care about this. And I get those questions, I'm guessing you do from time to time, yeah. Jessica. What's the status of Costco? Uh, it's still it's yeah. still underway, and uh, we're anticipating that uh, it will keep moving forward. Maybe by maybe by December of 2023, we'll do Christmas shopping in Costco. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. So, Jessica, um, you have a, a rich, deep background in economic development. Uh, you may want to talk about that, and I'll give you a chance to talk about just what kind of you bring to the job, and then like move right into why do we do it this way? Why do we have a group like LEDP in Longmont that does economic development work while in some other cities it might be done by the city or you know city staff members? But start with a little bit about you and then the why and the background on this. Sure, and you froze a little bit on me there for a second, so I didn't hear all of what you said. So I'm gonna give it a shot and if I missed anything, um, let me know. Uh, well, whoever views this, they won't mind me freezing. Okay. <laughs> right, over here. Yeah, they might mind it if you freeze. So. Okay. Sounds good. Um, yep. So as you said, Jessica Erickson, president and CEO of Longmont Economic Development Partnership. I've been uh, with this organization for um, going on seven years. It'll be seven years in um, February of next year. Uh, so I started here in early 2015. Um, most recently before that, um, I had done economic development at the state level in the State Office of Economic Development and International Trade for a couple of years. And I've also done economic development locally, both with a public-private partnership organization in Broomfield and then um, within the halls of city government in the city of Thornton. So I have the full array of experience, both from local all the way up to state level economic development, as well as public-private and public-private partnership economic development. So I bring that full range of perspective to how we approach economic development in Longmont and at Longmont Economic Development Partnership. Um, I think the other question was, why do we do it this way uh, here in Longmont? And uh, so the Longmont Economic Development Partnership has been around uh, for over 40 years now, or exactly 40 years now, as an organization in some form or fashion. Some of your viewers might re uh, recall the Economic Development Association of Longmont, that then became the Longmont Area Economic Council. And then in 2016, we became the Longmont Economic Development Partnership, which is a very intentional transition. Um, and part of how I ended up here was that in 2014-ish, uh, uh, the city of Longmont and the then Longmont Area Economic Council um, uh, took on a citywide market assessment for opportunity related to economic development and really kind of where we sat as a community um, in terms of uh, the strength of the community and our competitiveness to pursue and win economic development um, deals, business development investment for our community. Uh, and one of the things they looked at was the structure of how we did economic development here in Longmont. Uh, the end result of that was the original advanced Longmont strategy um, that really called for a whole new level of collaboration related to economic development that hadn't existed here in Longmont before uh, and certainly didn't really exist in a lot of other places either. Uh, it was part of the appeal for me, in fact, to, um, to come here and um, uh, lead this organization. And um, so that new level of collaboration really required um, you know, public sector, private sector, nonprofit, education, 
and um, just a variety of perspectives um, to bring to and, and contribution of a variety of expertise to bring to our approach to economic development. And that really lended itself to more of a public private partnership model as opposed to uh, economic development from inside the halls of city government model. Um, previous to that, the Economic Council did exist. There was also an internal economic development department at the city. Each had different roles and responsibilities. Uh, my understanding, not totally clear though, there was definitely some, some gray area in terms of who did what when, which really resulted in some loss of opportunity for the city of Longmont. Um, so that's part of it. But then, you know, more pragmatically, it's just a much more cost effective approach for the city to economic development. So we have a contract with the city of Longmont um, that we uh, seek to renew on an annual basis to provide that economic development service to the city. Um, it's about $350,000 per year that we're funded by the city um, to do economic development work. And we raise the rest of our funding from the private sector, as well as a couple of other public sector sources, which really results in for the city's you know, $350,000 annual investment in economic development, you get a $750,000 to $800,000 a year economic development program. Um, so there's cost effectiveness. There's also an accountability piece to it too. Um, so we really look to those who are going to benefit most from the work of economic development to underwrite the work of economic development. And certainly there's case to be made for that direct fiscal impact to the city if we're successful. So benefit to the city, uh, which is why we really look to the city to be one of the larger investors in economic development. Um, but then the private sector is absolutely going to benefit from a successful economic development program. And so we think they're also accountable uh, to help fund that program, or as I said, underwrite that program. And then just general efficiency of communication. When we talk to site selection consultants, uh, corporate real estate executives, corporate decision makers, uh, having that um, one-stop shop, one place to go that's outside of the halls of city government, which can be bogged down sometimes in red tape and bureaucracy, um, having that place to go when they're considering a location for expansion or investment or relocation um, is of benefit and keeps us on more lists longer um, from the perspective of kind of that traditional economic development deal-making piece. So um, I wanna circle back before we're finished, uh, to, I'm gonna to wanna to come back to kind of as a summarizing this interview, um, some of the ideas that underlie that public-private partnership, but I'll leave that to a kind of a closing question. Um, just how typical, it sounds like leverage is a big part of this, right? You, you're using a city investment and you're leveraging that into a, a multiple of what the city puts into this because of the shared interests. How typical or atypical is Longmont's approach compared to other municipalities like ours, 100,000 people? Sure. Um, so I will answer that, but I think you brought up a really good point that I don't want to lose about leverage. So when we go out to raise private sector dollars for economic development, generally the first question that we're asked is, are you supported by the local government? Uh, because private sector wants to put their dollars where they know they're going to be able to have an impact. And they know that they can't have an impact in a community if what they're investing in isn't aligned with the goals and the vision of the city itself and isn't um, doesn't have a collaborative cooperative partnership with the city itself. So we're absolutely leveraging that um, private sector investment to um, to pursue or public sector investment to pursue private sector investment. And um, so the how typical is this model for economic development? The International Economic Development Council does a a salary survey every two years. And one of the questions they ask us is the nature of our organization. Is it public? Is it private? Is it public private? And the most recent one of those says that about a third of all economic development organizations across the state, whether they be regional or state regional or local have that public private nonprofit model. Um, at about 100,000 population. And then as you get larger and get more regional and and larger than that um, is where uh, you start to see it be even more common uh, than that. Although the data was a little hard to parse through, so I'm not gonna give exact numbers, but it does become more common as you um, get into larger communities and especially as you're looking at taking a more regional approach to economic development. Although I will say, so along with EDP, um, in a lot of places, especially across Colorado is kind of seen as a model for how that works. And so we get 
um, a lot of folks from across the state and sometimes across the country reaching out to us to, you know, kind of ask how we do it and, and how to create an organization. And we're starting to get that outreach from smaller and smaller communities. So in our own backyard, the city of Erie um, has established a public private economic development organization. We're talking to Steamboat Springs, uh, providing resource to them to, um, or kind of guess, technical assistance to them in terms of how to create a public private partnership organization. I think just more and more communities are seeing the benefit of um, bringing all parties to the table to uh, achieve our economic development goals and objectives. So relatively common becoming more common, I would say. And then I mentioned that it's very common when you're looking at a more regional approach to economic development. So regional organizations like countywide organizations or Northern Colorado region, Metro Denver regional um, kind of economic development organizations um, oftentimes are public private or solely uh, private uh, sector funded organizations. And the reality is, is that as of right now, Boulder County does not have a Boulder County regional organization. Um, so it's really us and the Boulder Economic Council, also a public private model for economic development that kind of sit at the top of that and are, are um, providing most of the resource and most of the um, kind of expertise towards economic development across the region. Um, so in the absence of a larger regional um, economic development um, presence uh, makes this model for us as a community um, that much more valuable. So, it, uh, so uh, clearly skin in the game on the part of your partners uh, mm -hmm. is important in, in it, both, both in terms of what it means to potential um, uh, corporations or decisions by, by entities to, to relocate or to locate or to expand to Longmont. And that the model itself isn't so much of a break the mold, but, but execution of the model. And I want to come back to execution as a differentiator before we're finished with this as well, because I do think, I think we're in an era where differentiation is going to matter and, and what it takes to differentiate between one and another. Can you capture just in a sentence or two LEDP's mission? Sure. So our stated mission is, um, is, uh, leading a collaborative approach to economic development. Um, our vision for that is uh, this collective impact model um, that we've taken, which really is about aligning organizations and individuals across the community, across around a shared agenda to achieve um, our economic development goals and visions, um, which are really um, today um, much less growth oriented and more prosperity and inclusion oriented. So we look at how does the growth that we pursue as an economic development organization um, become shared across our entire community or benefit our entire community from a prosperity and inclusion perspective. And um, so we're really looking to achieve, and I I'm sorry, I know you said one or two sentences, but um, <laughs> just equal access for everyone in our community to be able to participate in the economy that we're developing or building as a community. You better be careful. You're going to start to be accused of answering questions like I do. I know. <laughs> so, uh, with way more words. Than, uh, so, so just in a word or in a in a phrase, your mission isn't growth for growth's sake. It is not. No, I mean that's a, that's a very short sighted vision, and I get where that comes from because I think there was a day and age, um, and I worked for some of those folks that. Um, really took that kind of approach to economic development, but really I don't know of an economic development organization or practitioner um, that takes that approach, nor do any of our partners or investors see that as a good business model for themselves or for this community as a whole. Um, it would be a really short-sighted, like I said, approach to um, how we ensure long-term, um, again, prosperity and resiliency for our local economy. So let's unpack just a little bit um, the, 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 if the end, the part of the end game is prosperity for the community, you get there through goals and objectives and strategies, right? Mm -hmm. So just unpack a little bit about goals, objective strategies, take however you want to emphasize each of those, uh, the strategies is the means to get to the end, obviously of goals. Um, and, um, uh, what that, what's different here than, than others might see, and you can kind of unpack some of those ideas of prosperity and collective impact as you do that. 
Um, sure. So I think when we uh, talk about um, an economy that works for all and is accessible to all and creates opportunity um, to build wealth and um, progress in in, um, in whatever way somebody would want to economically, um, we really look at uh, a few key focus areas within our Advance on 2.0 strategy. So ta certainly talent is a big um, piece of what we're looking at. How do we attract and retain um, the talent that's needed to support the industry base that we have, as well as to encourage um, additional industry investment in our community. And so that's both attracting new talent into our community from across the country, but it's also working with our partners at St. Rain Valley School District, Front Range Community College, uh, some of the sector partnerships regionally, and um, our workforce development system to um, create what we call talent pipelines. So how do we get um, our kids here locally from K through 12 into whatever the next um, step looks like for them uh, to be able to, again, achieve um, a, a career pathway um, and uh, uh, wealth building opportunity within our community so that they don't have to go elsewhere um, to achieve that. So um, that's our focus on talent. Industry is kind of the core of, of economic development. So the outcome um, which is creating more jobs and um, generate or increasing the tax base through business investment and, and um, sales tax. And so uh, that's the going out and finding new opportunities. But really a lot of our uh, work is right here locally supporting our existing industry base's ability to stay here, be successful here and continue to expand and grow here and create new jobs here. Um, embracing placemaking as an economic development strategy um, which really ties into, I mean, they all tie together, right? So that really ties into talent and, and where do people want to be um, to live and work and play and spend their dollars. Um, connectivity, transportation connectivity, again, ties into everything else. So how do people get from where they live to where they work, whether it be here locally or regionally? And then, um, and then just really impact. So um, how are we approaching, how is the city approaching and how can we contribute to the city's approach to policymaking that has that same outcome and end result that we've all determined through the development of Advance on Want 2.0 and our collective impact work is um, our vision for the future of our community. So how, how different, the, the goals that you just described and the strategy, how different are those from what goals the city would adopt? They are the city's goals, ah. um, quite frankly. So um, we, the very first step that we took when we um, updated our strategic for, plan from Advance Long Want to Advance Long Want 2.0 is we painstakingly assessed every single plan, documented plan that we could find in the city from the original Advance Long Want plan from Envision Long Want, the city council work plan, all of the sub area plans, the downtown master plan, the transportation plan, the main street corridor plan, uh, we literally created a table of all of those and put all of the goals and objectives of all of those plans side by side and identified where they aligned, which meant we were most likely to have the greatest amount of success from a collective impact framework perspective. So bringing a variety of perspectives and expertise together to um, pursue those objectives. So the objectives and goals of Advanced on 1.2.0, therefore our goals and objectives as an organization don't they align with, not only do they align with, um, not only do they complement, but they are the goals of the city of Longmont, the stated goals of the city of Longmont, which then transfers into our contract with the city of Longmont too. So the goals and objectives in our contract with the city of Longmont are the same as those in advance on what 2.0 are the same as those where there was alignment in all of those other plans and strategies. Awesome. So when all that comes together, uh, you've got a prospect, a lead, if you will, mm -hmm. Uh, what's the kind of inside baseball that, you know, that most people don't get a chance to see as it unfolds? You go into an executive session with city council, you know, that's kind of a black box for folks as it should be, because those are all, you know, confidential meetings. But what happens when you've got a lead, when all that rolls up into a potential success? Mm -hmm. uh, what is it like, right? What do you, what do you bring and what's the potential outcome? 
Um, yeah, so it's not one size fits all. So I'll, I'll, I'll um, encapsulate it, it into that as much as possible. We're receiving um, opportunities, um, leads for opportunities from a variety of different sources, whether it's you know a response to something that we've put out into the world from a marketing campaign perspective or um, a lead from that we're participating on with the State Office of Economic Development, the Regional Economic Development Corporation, or somebody's contacted us directly, or a lot of times it's a business that's already here that's looking at where they can continue to expand and grow. So all of those um, different paths have their own nuances, but generally speaking, when we connect with a leader, somebody that's interested in expanding or relocating their business here to Longmont, um, the first question that we have for them is what are their key drivers in terms of um, how they're going to decide on the best location um, from them? I think not surprisingly, in a lot of cases, it's talent, it's operating costs, it's um, in some cases, transportation access, utilities, utility infrastructure, uh, education, um, all of the things that we think we do really well here in Long Island. So that's the first thing is that we're taking whatever that their individual key decision drivers are and putting together for them a customized package of, um, we heard you said that you're looking for this and this is why we think Long Island is the best place for you uh, relative to those things. Um, and so that looks like just a package of information um, that um, anything from, you know, we get down to what are your uh, what are the actual occupation codes of, of hiring that you're trying to do wherever you locate so that we can do some labor force analysis so we can show the strength of the labor infrastructure here in Longmont to, again, those operating costs and those utilities costs, um, if possible, in comparison to communities we might be competing with. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you're cutting me off. No, um, and no then, I just had something show up on my computer screen and I was going to. And gonna, so the goal yeah. there is to um, end up on a list of uh, communities that that company is seriously considering for that expansion or relocation project. Um, in some cases, we find out back from them that, um, yes, they think Longmont is a great place for them. They also think City B is a great place for them and City B um, may be offering incentives or may have some other competitive advantage over us from a cost perspective, at which point in time we'll start the conversation about incentives that may be available to them um, here in the city of Longmont, potentially with the state of Colorado. Um, with the city of Longmont incentives, um, we have our, our incentives are codified um, in terms of what we can offer. So we have a fee rebate and a business personal property tax rebate program. We also have you know, some locations within the enterprise zone, which creates an incentive for, for folks. But um, with those uh, Longmont incentives, local Longmont incentives, um, before we're offering those incentives to a company, uh, we meet with city council in executive session, give them the, um, the, the scope of the project, um, the potential fiscal and economic benefits of the project to the community, and then get direction from city council as to whether or not and to what extent to negotiate those incentives. And then we'll go and make that proposal to the company um, as part of their, one part of their consideration of Longmont as the place that they want to grow into. Um, I will say that we, on average, um, uh, work with 50 or so prospect leads throughout the year. Um, I think you know if we do two to four executive sessions throughout the year for projects. So um, in most cases, we're competing on um, the, the value proposition of the community and not the addition of incentives. On a rare occasion where um, we don't have a competitive advantage over a community that we're competing with or another community has offered incentives and we're trying to um, compete with that, and the scope and scale of the project in terms of economic and fiscal impact makes it a good investment with a significant ROI for our city. And that's when we're um, leveraging those incentive programs that again are codified with, um, within city code. So, so you don't go into an executive session and walk out with a big check? No, to, absolutely To hand not. to a corporation, that's not how it works? <laughs> absolutely not. And in fact, Colorado and all of the municipalities therein are notoriously um, not incentive driven states when it comes to economic development and all incentives, both at the state and the local level um, in Colorado and in every municipality in Colorado are, um, are performance based. And so no check gets written until an investment is made. Um, in some cases, 
Um, in the case of a fee rebate, a check can be written before the jobs are created, but if the jobs aren't then later created, there's a clawback provision that says that we get um, those dollars back that the company is agreeing to if they don't um, achieve that those job creation metrics. Thanks. I, I'm guessing you don't do all this by yourself. Absolutely you, you have not. some other people with you, both uh, staff and board. Yes. So who, who makes up LADP? What should people know? They, they'll see your face, they'll hear your name. Who's on your board? Who works with you to put all this together? Yeah, so first of all, I'll say staff. I have an incredible small but mighty team here. There are four of us doing the work of Longmont Economic Development Partnership. So I'm really focused on, of course, as CEO, the high level strategy and, and finances of the organization, as well as based on my experience, kind of that primary industry prospect um, development and um, some of the um, kind of advocacy work that we do as an organization. Um, and then I have somebody else that's really focused on um, our existing industry base all the way from our very early stage startup businesses to our larger corporations and ensuring their ability to um, succeed and grow here. And then I have somebody who is specifically focused on Advanced Longmont 2.0, serving as the backbone to that collective impact framework that we use um, to implement that strategy. Um, and then my board of directors is representative of, we have about a hundred private sector contributors to the organization on an annual basis. And my board of directors is elected from um, those investors. And so um, it's a really good cross section of industry. And so therefore expertise um, looking at how we approach economic development and bringing those um, that kind of wisdom and expertise that they bring from the private sector into what we do. So we have um, uh, both of the hospitals here in Longmont are represented represented on my board of directors, Longmont United Hospital and um, UC Health. Um, we have financiers from um, uh, Adams Bank and Trust and now High Plains Bank, as well as um, Cornerstone Home Lending on the home lending side. Um, we have builders, um, some construction, and we have primary industry representatives. Um, from uh, Left Hand Brewing Company, um, um, I'm missing one, uh, from Enersys, from H2 Manufacturing Solutions. So again, a really diverse perspective of those who will benefit from the work of our organization, certainly, but also have um, a diverse skill set to contribute to the work that we're doing because there are just four of us here on staff. That sounds like a group of people who are seriously and deeply invested in Longmont. Absolutely. So yeah. how do you want both the city staff, the city council and the residents, but in particular, the city to, to view you and your board? And how do you view the city, both council members and staff members? Um, sure. So we view the city as a partner. Um, certainly we are uh, we do have a contractual relationship with the city in terms of the service that we provide, um, but we really view the city as a partner um, in the work that we do. There are a lot of analogies. I'm super guilty of using a ton of different analogies around this, so I was deciding which one I would use today. Um, and one of my favorites is um, that a former boss of mine kind of taught me is um, really when you think about economic development and then um, kind of city government, um, the difference between business development and product development, right? So if you consider your economic development practitioner or organization as your business development representative, the person that's going out there and generating business and, and, and revenue for the organization, and then your city government is product development. So I, as business development, have most contact with the customer, right? So I have the best sense of what they need um, and what would sell them on our product, which is our community. Um, so we take the approach of taking that information that we're gaining from listening to our customer to um, providing um, information and suggestions and recommendations to the city, whether it be city staff or city council for how we can improve the product so we can do a better job of selling it. So. Um, it, it really is about um, bringing a voice to the table to improve the product of our city, strengthen our competitive position relative to economic development. Uh, so let me just um, ask you if you could just frame this real quickly. Mm -hmm. The difference between what you and your board does and what city council does. Absolutely. So 
my my board and I, like I said, we're um, we're kind of in in the weeds. Um, we're in the community. We're uh, listening to, engaging with, having constant conversation uh, with our primary industry base, uh, with our partner organizations, with um, those who are charged with developing talent within our community. Um, and and a lot of what we're hearing is how this community could do better um, to make them more successful and more likely to continue to invest in our community. And so we take that to make recommendations to, or suggestions to city staff for, you know, this is what we're hearing. This is how we can improve as a community to improve our ability to um, achieve our goals and visions. And then, and then from there, you know, it's the, the city council makes policy, um, city staff executes that policy. Um, what we really want to be is a source for, um, uh, for information and again, recommendations and suggestions that we're hearing from the streets on, on, on some of the policies, processes, and um, programs that could improve our ability to be successful as economic developers. The city council makes policy. Mm -hmm. You make recommendations or you and your board make recommendations. When you say, when you see your partner, the city, Mm -hmm. headed in a direction that you're not certain is going to be productive in terms of what we're trying to do or what the city or you're trying to do with the city in terms of economic development. What, what's your approach to say to your partner, uh, wait a minute, <laughs> we think this is not going to be helpful? Yeah, so we try to be as proactive and productive as possible. Like I said, it's not me, it's not Jessica at Longmont EDP that's saying, hey, um, that might not be in the best interest of achieving our economic development objectives. It's, I've said to our, you know, the prospects that we're working with or our existing industry base or our partners, the city is looking at doing this um, and get feedback that says, you know, if the city does this, then I might not do the thing that the city wants me to do, whether it's grow my business, build houses, whatever it might be. Um, and so sharing that information with the city, but not just saying, you know, we've heard that that may not be the best idea in terms of achieving our goals and objectives or economic development goals and objectives, but also here were some suggestions that we received um, for what might work better um, for benefit of both the public sector and the private sector in achieving those goals and objectives. So it's not a caution without a recommendation or a proposal or some ideas. Absolutely not. Yeah. And yeah, and I mean, I think very rarely, um, if ever, have we gone, um, to, whether it be to city council or to city staff and just obstinately said, we oppose this. Um, usually um, in every case that I can think of, it's been um, either that's a good idea, but we also think that this would contribute to achieving our goals and objectives as an add-on to that, or um, we've heard that that might not uh, be conducive to what we're trying to achieve, but maybe a little uh, tweak here or there, and um, we could really make it work for everybody. All right. Um, the All of it rolls up into both successes and disappointments, I'm yeah. guessing. You don't win every time, but you win enough to, you know, to, yeah. to mark some successes. What do you... What, what are the big learnings? What do, you, what do you learn from both your successes and the disappointments in this whole process? And then I'm going to, the next question is going to be about anticipating the future, but just looking backwards, um, what have you learned from both uh, the wins and the losses? Sure. So I think we've been, um, from a traditional economic development perspective, certainly incredibly successful in recent years here in Longmont. Um, whether it be Smuckers or Costco, our recent announcement about Light Deck and their manufacturing facility. Um, as you said before, Longmont EDP, I, Jessica Erickson, didn't do those things by myself. Um, there's always um, collaboration and I always get, you know, quick response and all hands on deck response from the city when we're pursuing those opportunities. And I think that has absolutely been what's made us successful. Um, I think you know, we've seen, and I've been a part of a situation where the economic development organization and the city staffing council were almost adversarial, um, which doesn't work for anyone, uh, right? So the fact that we have been anything but that um, to almost an extreme and part of why other organizations kind of look to us to how do you do that um, is that we've done a really good job just working together um, with the end in mind and um, bringing all of our resources to the table from uh, staff and from my organization uh, to, to get those wins. 
um, in some cases where we weren't maybe even on the list um, at the start of a um, project's uh, search for a location. And then even taking that to um, achieving things for our community like the North Metro Enterprise Zone designation, Opportunity Zone designation, um, and some of the other uh, new programs and tools and resources that we've been able to bring to our community in the last few years. Again, not things that I did or that Longmont EDP did, but that we did um, collectively. And I think um, as a result made our kind of application, our pursuit for those um, programs and resources that much more um, compelling because um, we weren't competing with each other. We weren't um, making things more difficult for the decision makers for those programs by kind of coming from all over the place or not having all the resources available. Um, so I think disappointments, um, I think, um, for me, what's been disappointment and I think just an ongoing learning process for everyone is that, um, that our approach to, as we've talked about bringing some of those suggestions and recommendations as an organization, um, to the city council, um, we feel like we're, um, making those suggestions in the best interest of the community. Um, and while there are um, individual organizations or private sector entities that may ultimately long-term benefit from some of those things, um, we don't take the approach of, um, you know, we're gonna support this because it's going to put more money in somebody's pocket. Um, in fact, if anybody even suggests that's a reason why they want to be a part of our organization, we just don't engage. Um, and so really everybody um, that's part of my board, part of my leadership council, been participating on the Advance Longmont 2.0 working groups, our new Prosper Longmont Coalition is really coming at um, their investment and engagement in the organization with the best interest of the community in mind. And I think sometimes we don't agree on the how, even internally, much less between kind of some of our city leadership and um, some members of our organization. Um, but everybody has bought into, and that's part of the model of collective impact, everybody has bought into um, the idea of a shared vision and a common agenda for what we want to see our community be um, now and in the future. And again, if they haven't, we just don't engage with them. And so I think it's disappointing um, when I hear that there's a perception um, that it's anything but that coming from our organization. And so certainly something that you know, we've talked about internally, we have to do a better job of telling our story and telling that to people. So thank you for the, this opportunity to do that. Um, but then we also hope that our city leaders are listening and um, and taking that at face value. And that's what what we say. Well, we're, this is all about storytelling. So hopefully, yeah. <laughs> hopefully the story uh, will be heard by folks. So I've got two more questions and I want to kind of uh, wrap this all up, kind of going back to where we started with a couple of questions here at the end. And, and one is that the model itself is not a break the mold model. As you said, there are a third of the, you know, municipalities our size who take this public private ship, public private partnership approach. Um, and that execution likely <laughs> matters. So yeah. we we're all anticipating a post pandemic era. We hope it gets here soon. We, we yeah. would hope we would be there now, but we're not quite there. Yeah. What will be the differentiator for us, for Longmont as a municipality that, that is in the interest of this community to continue to prosper, not just grow, right? Mm -hmm. But prosper in ways that serve broadly the community. What differentiates Longmont from other communities going forward in, in your mind? Um, yes, that's a good question. I mean, I think there's an element of it that's, you know, post pandemic world and some of the changes that we've seen or transformations that we've seen um, generally globally um, as a result of the pandemic. I think some of those things being an acceleration of things that were inevitable anyway, but then we're also facing um, in Longmont finite opportunity to get it right um, from a capacity perspective, whether that be from real estate capacity or population capacity. Um, uh, utility capacities. So um, I think um, related to both and in the interest of um, kind of the idea of equitable um, economic development, ensuring that our future growth benefits everyone in our community, um, that we need to become even more strategic about how we're making investments as a community in, um, in projects. So not, e not just looking at uh, how many jobs is this uh, company going to create and how, how much is their investment, but 
um, what are their opportunities for um, workers at all skill levels? Um, what are their on-the-job training and work-based learning opportunities? Um, what kind of wages are they paying um, from the bottom production level wages all the way up? And what is the disparity between um, the top and the bottom? And so really um, ensuring that um, companies that we're investing in through incentives are aligned with our values and aligned with our long-term vision um, as an equitable community that creates prosperity for everyone. Um, I think all of our businesses are gonna have to um, adapt to um, innovative new business practices, um, technology, and um, a very different labor market. Um, I think there are some things that about today's labor market that aren't going to change. And so how do we bring resource to businesses, or especially our small locally owned businesses to be able to effectively adapt um, to those. Um, Public-private partnerships, I know in some places um, it's kind of a, uh, not a lot of people like to think of the private sector, you know, as um, contributing meaningfully to um, uh, things like equity and prosperity within a community, but um, our experience has been the exact opposite. And um, the idea behind collective impact is addressing challenges that no individual organization uh, can address on their own, but bringing a collective to them. And there are a lot of resources, um, human, financial, and otherwise within the private sector that can be brought to bear for those things. Um, and then um, I think prioritizing people, um, just I think we've learned that lesson in a really, really hard way um, as a result of the pandemic. But I think that was one of those accelerating the inevitable kind of situations. So how are we incorporating investing in people in our community in terms of skills development, um, uh, career pathway development, all the way from you know K through 12, um, early childhood and um, early childhood education and care. How are we investing in the residents of Longmont um, from the day they're born all the way up through their um, kind of cradle to grave um, lifetime here within our community? So some of what I just heard, I, I know is a reflection of, and this will be my last question and then you may have last comments. Uh, there's an underlying um, uh, construct uh, or organizing framework. I'm not certain the way you would think about this, the right language of, of the, a concept, a construct called new localism. Mm -hmm. So public-private partnerships, some of what you referred to or referenced in terms of the private sector caring about equity and, and prosperity broadly in the community um, as kind of fundamental to, how, to what makes this work. Any, any little highlights you want to share or, or some of the organizing principles that underlie in, in, in the construct of new localism that would help people understand there's a deeper uh, theoretical, philosophical, um, uh, and evidence-based framework that supports this work? Um, yeah, so new localism is a really, and again, I don't know the right terminology, either philosophy or ideology yeah. behind how we approach economic development um, from the, through the lenses of prosperity, inclusion, and equity, um, and really um, a recognition that responsibility for addressing some of those challenges is being pushed down to cities and to regions um, because there's not resource um, for, or um there are structural structural limitations to the federal or state governments being able to address those challenges on our behalf. And so um, new localism is really about solving those problems um, kind of from the bottom up. So from our local community up rather than top down and engaging networks of um, institutions and leaders and, and um, thought leaders and the, and, and the brightest minds where we can find them to addressing those challenges rather than just looking to the public sector alone um, to address those challenges. And I think the biggest example of that today is um, uh, workforce housing, attainable housing, and there are a variety of different terms being um, used relative to that issue. Um, and we hear oftentimes, you know, we're not going to build our way out of this issue, but we're not going to policy our way out of this issue either. It's going to take public policy. It's going to take building. It's going to take creative and innovative approaches. Um, there's no amount of policy that you can create that's going to address the systemic inequities in um, home lending um, as agreed um, by 
our financial institutions here in Longmont. So if there's not an opportunity for those financial institutions to engage in the conversation and be a part of the solution, again, there's no number of homes that you can build or policies that you can create that are going to address that challenge. And that challenge is a piece of the bigger um, issue at hand in terms of ensuring that everyone in Longmont has access to um, equity building home ownership, equitable access to equity building home ownership uh, within our community. So we've been hearing for decades about thinking globally and acting locally. And mm -hmm. what I think I heard you just say is that there, there were at a time and new localism is a way to operationalize that whole idea of thinking globally, acting locally in the interest of prosperity, equity, social justice, um, you know, what we need to create together as a community. So yeah. um, listen, I, I very much appreciate your availability for this episode of The Backstory. Any final thoughts you want to share? I think I've said enough. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, hopefully, hopefully we haven't gone on so long that no one will listen, but I think it's an important story. So thank you for this time. Thank you more importantly for the great work you do on behalf of the community. You could be doing this a lot of places. I know the fact that you do it in Longmont on behalf of Longmont, I appreciate. I know there are many, many others in Longmont who do as well. So Longmonters, uh, this is the backstory on Longmont's Economic Development Partnership. Uh, stay tuned. We will we'll come back at you with more stories, more backstories on things you'd like to learn about Longmont that you're not going to read in the headlines of the Times Call or the Longmont Leader or other social media. Thanks. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Tim. <laughs>